My name is uh, Aswat Thomas. I'm the Vice President of the Alliance for Safety and Justice. I also serve as the National Director of one of our flagship programs, which is uh, Crime Survivors for Safety and Justice. When ASJ was founded 10 years ago, for us, it was never about just reducing incarceration. Um, for us, it's always been about safety. You talk about your work with CSSJ and like centering survivors in that, and something that's always struck me in doing this work is how, how it isn't like the criminal justice system is not centered around survivors needs kind of the more egregious thing to me is where you have folks speaking on behalf of survivors and saying like well this is what they want yeah. they want juvenile life without parole sentences they want you know um extreme prison terms they want barriers to re-entry like and then you talk to crime survivors and they're like overwhelmingly like that doesn't help me to yeah. have this other person's life ruined many of our survivors uh you know think about how, you know, for many of us, you know, you have, well, there's uh, legislators, you have law enforcement, key decision makers always, um, you know, uh, speaking on behalf of victims. Since the, you know, the 1990s, we've passed in this country about 32,000 laws that were designed and meant to help uh, crime uh, victims. But in fact, a lot of those uh, laws have actually failed uh, crime uh, victims because majority of uh, crime victims do not access victim compensation. Majority of crime victims do not access uh, victim services, and, and, and in fact, a lot of those laws have you know um, you know destroyed communities, especially uh, communities of uh, of color. For crime victims, the one thing that we want uh, the most is what happened to us not to happen again, and the second we want what happened to us not to happen to uh, someone else. And you know, you do that by not focusing on punishment, you do that by focusing on rehabilitation, you do that by focusing on things that help uh, stop the cycle of violence. In the state of Michigan, less than 2% of victims get access to the state's victims' uh, conversation program. Six in 10 uh, crime victims prefer shorter prison sentences rather than more spending on incarceration. A majority of crime victims prefer like holding people accountable through alternative options beyond prison, uh, such as more rehabilitation, more mental health services, more restorative justice, more community uh, service uh, program. That is a different view uh, uh, from um, you know what politicians or what, uh, what, what law enforcement think what crime victims want. For us, we actually want more rehabilitation and shorter uh, prison sentences. You yourself are a crime um, survivor, and um, obviously do a lot of the work that you do now advocating is on behalf of like the voices of other people mm -hmm. you've actually sat and listened to. But um, can you tell us a little bit about what your experience with violence was growing up, and then like in the aftermath of that and and since you know what. What were your actual needs? Yeah, um, so you know, I'm from uh, Highland Park. I grew up on uh, in Highland Park on uh, on Geneva and Hamilton Avenue. Um, and you know, for me, you know, violence has impacted my life for decades. Uh, it started uh, back in uh, 1993. Um, I had a best friend. Uh, his name was Ruben Elder. You know, Ruben and I we walked to school every day uh, together. We played basketball every day. We did all the things you know kids. Uh, would do to have fun in our uh, neighborhood. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, just weeks before we were supposed to start uh, the fifth grade, uh, Ruben was shot and killed uh, in a drive-by shooting in Highland Park. Um, and, you know, he was uh, shot and killed at 10 years old. And, you know, for me, you know, he was the first friend that I lost uh, to uh, violence. And I remember during that time back in 1993, you know, it was a, a few days before uh, school was starting. So we went back to school um, and there wasn't, you know, no grief counselors at our school. Um, there wasn't no services in the community. Our parents and family didn't know how to talk about it. They didn't know how to kind of help us uh, grieve of, of dealing with, uh, you know, uh, someone who've lost their lives to at such a young age. So our entire community, um, in fact, have never healed from that incident back in, uh, 1993. Uh, so for me, after lo losing Ruben to violence, I doubled down on playing uh, basketball. I doubled down on my uh, education because I didn't want to become another victim of, of violence in my neighborhood. And so I, I was able to successfully uh, do that. Um, I became the first male of my family to ever graduate uh, from college. So in 2009, I was on my way to play professional basketball um, overseas. So I was like on an all-time uh, high. Um, but, you know, but quickly it became the uh, lowest point um, in my life when I uh, was shot twice on my back, um, you know, while leaving a corner store in my neighborhood in Hartford, uh, Connecticut.
um, and you know those bullets ended my basketball career um, and, and nearly uh, my life. I remember them telling me about the challenges that I would have uh, physically, um, you know, recovering from uh, those gunshot wounds. But nobody never talked to me about the psychological effects of being a victim. So as I was recovering, law enforcement came to visit me several times. And for me, you know, each time, if I can be honest, like each time they came to visit me, you know, I became more stressed um, because when they came to visit me, it was always about the case. Um, they never asked me how I was doing. They never told me about the victim compensation uh, program, which is meant to help crime victims like myself get support. They never connected me to any victim services in my neighborhood. In fact, they never even connected me to a victim advocate in the police department who's supposed to work with victims uh, like uh, myself. And so, you know, law enforcement uh, didn't provide any help or support. Um, the hospital did a great job of physically healing uh, my wounds, um, but there was no follow up from the hospital as it relates to victim service. So my family and I were really left to deal with this experience on um, our, on our own. You know, um, I lost about 40 friends to gun violence uh, throughout my life. And I just recall like, you know, talking to their parents, like there wasn't no support uh, for them. And then I started to think about my own uh, family um, as well. My father was shot in the 1980s. My brother was shot in his back in the 1990s. I have two cousins who's also been um, shot as well. So as I was recovering, I started to call them and ask them like, hey, when you got shot, uh, did you get any help? And all of them said no, they never received any support or services. And so for me in my immediate family, you know, six out of 10 males are victims of, of gun violence and none of us receive any support um, at, at all. And so for me, it wasn't just my family, it was my neighborhood. Then I started talking to victims of domestic violence, victims of sexual assault. And it was that shared experience that we all had, whether you're a victim of gun violence, you've lost a child to violence, or you're a victim of domestic violence, or sexual assault, or human trafficking. We all had the same common theme that we became victims, and 99% of the people did, did not get any um, help at all. So I started to kind of think about, okay, I want to do something about this of what I experienced, what my family, what my entire community um, was experiencing um, as well. But the one final thing that really changed uh, my life, you know, I learned that, you know, from the doctor that saved my life, uh, he started to tell me the story of a young, another young man who life he had saved uh, four years before I got shot um, and the more details he shared about that uh, young man um, while I'm laying on an operating table uh, having surgery to remove the bullets out of my back um, I started to realize he was describing one of the young men um, that shot me and I remember that experience of laying on that operating table hearing my doctor describe this young man um, and I remember him telling me that story because we both grew up in the same neighborhood and I remember saying Dr. Marshall do you realize you just described the person that shot me? And I remember my doctor, he paused the surgery and he said, get out of here. Like, are you serious? And I said, you just described him. And I knew that because of the patch that young man had on his eye, because that young man at the age of 14 was shot and he lost sight in his eye. So I remember the physical characteristics of him and, and, and from that point on I thought about if I as an adult was a victim of gun violence didn't receive any support any help at all that young man age, age of 14 years old got released from that same hospital back into that same uh, community I can't even imagine what he was going through at the age of 14 years old of being a victim and now having a physical disability and not getting any services and resources so I, I strongly believe his underdressed trauma played a huge role with me getting shot years later. That's just, I mean, that's so, you know, like poetically ironic, and I just got like goosebumps like everywhere, because I've seen your other interviews and stuff, but I didn't realize it was like during, like the actual, it's just like so, that's so mm -hmm. crazy. I, I imagine I would just be thinking like, okay, well here I am at this like same crossroads this other kid was at, mm -hmm. so like, I can't, I don't think you'd imagine yourself like moving on from that to, shooting somebody else but like that's what happened to him yeah and so yeah i could see that definitely starting the gears turning i guess let's um talk about so you know michigan is really like an outlier in our sentencing practices um i don't need to tell you how messed up they are um 
and since ASJ's focus is, like you said, on safety, that that's like the ultimate goal, um, and just taking a research-based approach to that, how do you, you know, what effect do you think our sentencing practices have on actual safety? If I mean, ostensibly, the, the goal is it's making Michigan safer. Um, I have a feeling maybe that's not your perspective. <laughs> Yeah, you know, you know, one I would say the state of Michigan have been doing a great job of of passing uh, legislation. As crime victims, we we strongly believe there should be accountability. But what does accountability uh, look like for for many uh, survivors who don't get help? Um, accountability is is actually providing support and services uh, to victims. It's like really helping to build this infrastructure of victim services um, that can provide a lot of support. Um, Because what I just shared about that young man who shot me, that is unaddressed trauma. That unaddressed trauma often leads to people uh, becoming uh, victims or often leads to them coming in contact with the uh, justice system. So we can do uh, just a better job of of, of providing support and services to uh, communities across uh, the state of Michigan. We also can can do a a better job, while there's been such great work in Michigan, we can do a a better job at helping to reduce unnecessary incarceration. And so the state of Michigan, uh, you know, passed Clean Slate, which is a a huge uh, legislative uh, bill to help, you know, people who have old records, old convictions, helping them get jobs uh, so that they can get back to work, uh, so they can get housing, uh, so they can get the support that's needed for economic stability so people can provide for themselves and provide for the family. Those are the things that help stop the cycle. But there's so much more that we can be doing um, in the state of Michigan because we all know that, you know, for everyone that's incarcerated in the Michigan Department of Corrections, they're coming home one day, right? Majority of people who are incarcerated will come home one day, whether it's two weeks from now, six months from now, or, 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 or 30 years from now. They're coming home uh, one day. We need to improve our rehabilitation um, across the state of Michigan. So one bill the Alliance for Safety and Justice are working on is productivity uh, credits. So it's really about incentivizing people who are currently incarcerated, incentivizing them to complete um, uh, you know, drug treatment programs, complete educational job skills uh, program, you know, not just, you know, um, having people, you know, encourage them, but incentivize them that they can receive uh, credits uh, on uh, their sentence that will allow them to see the parole board a little bit uh, so- sooner by completing these types of program safety is ensuring that people who are incarcerated get access to rehabilitation programs and safety is ensuring that when they come out of the justice system that they're able to access uh, housing and jobs, uh, things that help to stop the cycle of violence. So Michigan has been doing some great work, but we got a lot more work to do in really focusing on more rehabilitation um, and getting people out of the justice system who have been in there for far uh, too long. So you talked about the how much upside there is in sort of incremental reform, but if you could just, if I gave you a magic wand and just said like, all right, here we go, start from scratch, unlimited budget, whatever you want, how would you, and I realize this is a very broad question, but what would a more survivor-centric criminal justice system look like to you? Man, if I had a magic wand. So in this country, we spend about $80 billion a year on the justice uh, system, but majority of us still aren't uh, safe. Um, so I have, you know, one thing would be is to take those $80 billion a year, you know, take $70 billion of that to invest more in uh, prevention programs, um, invest more in youth programs, invest more in education, invest more in housing, invest more in reentry service, invest more in, in victim uh, services. We can stop an immense amount of crime and violence um, in uh, communities. So number one is like just reshifting our investments, um, you know, into uh, communities because for decades, especially in the state of uh, Michigan, we've took resources out of communities and invested those into the justice system. Now it's time to reverse the coin to take money out of the justice system and really invest more uh, in communities. So that's the number one thing uh, that I would uh, do. Uh, The second uh, is ensuring that for all of our policies and legislations, that they are uh, survivor-centered, right? And so instead of, you know, talking uh, for crime victims or talking on behalf of crime victims, actually having uh, survivors at the center of policy-making programs, um, at the center of of policies as well, to ensure that as we're thinking about 
accountability as we're thinking about uh, you know justice that we're doing that uh, with the perspectives and the experience of survivors at uh, the forefront. That's how we don't go back to the 90s of being more uh, tough on crime. We actually have, have to be more smart on safety by talking to crime victims. I think we can you know really build a, a system uh, that's more survivor centered and that's more focused on safety um, as it relates to uh, community uh, safety rather on punishment. Uh, the third thing is something that I'm excited uh, to announce. So the Alliance for Safety and Justice, we just launched a campaign called Just Safe, um, which is a public uh, education uh, campaign that's really designed to like invite you know voters into everyday people, right, into the conversation about what safety uh, looks like uh, for them. And you know, everywhere we go, this campaign and the messages is really resonating with a lot of uh, people because it's acknowledging the importance of uh, safety. So if you are listening, if you're watching this interview, I want you to just like close your eyes for like, you know, 10 seconds and, you know, think about where you feel most safe, right? So just think about where you feel most safe, close your eyes. For some of us, what, what we may be thinking about is I feel safe at home, right? I feel safe, um, you know, in my backyard barbecuing. Right. I feel safe at the recreation center. I feel safe, you know, at church. Not many of you have thought about I feel safe with incarceration. Right. So we actually need to invest in the places and the things that makes us feel uh, most safe. So we're excited about our Just Safe uh, campaign um, is really uh, working to you know elevate what safety looks like for us in this country. What safety looks like in Michigan is getting people back to work getting people jobs, helping to build the infrastructure in a state, and also helping to provide support for uh, survivors um, as well. So that's what a survivor-centered justice system uh, look like for me and so many other survivors across the state of Michigan. That's awesome. Um, it's really exciting to hear about the Just Safe um, initiative. I, um, yeah, I'm super excited to hear you speak at our signature event on the 18th um, and share some more of this. Uh, was there anything any like parting, you know, words of wisdom, little zingers you wanted to get in there before we close things out? Yeah, and I would like to say, you know, if you are a crime survivor um, in the state of uh, Michigan, you know, there's a community out there uh, for you. So so join the movement, join Crime Survivor for Safety and Justice, our Michigan uh, chapter. We have chapters across the state. You can do that by going to www.cssj.org. If you are out there living with a past conviction, living with a record, you also want to be part of a community. We have our Time Done uh, program, which is a, a network of, of, of people who are living with past uh, convictions. You can join that community as well by going to the website at timedone.org. Uh, uh, we're excited about the work uh, in Michigan. We're excited to be partnering with uh, folks like Safe and Just uh, Michigan to help us transform this uh, justice system and really uh, have a better system to have safety uh, in mind um, as well. Awesome. Super exciting work. It's been great to get to talk to you and um, get to know you a little bit beyond just the research and stuff ahead of time and uh, have a have a safe couple of weeks until we see you in the in October. Sounds good. Thanks, man. Right. See you soon.